Good afternoon, class. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for your many blessings. <clears throat> Again, we come to uh, ask you for guidance as we enter into this discussion of Adventist history. We thank you for your guidance through the century at, uh, and a quarter since we uh, began our work. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> our lesson today actually is going to cover two chapters. I don't like giving two, but there are some things I feel we can't leave out. And uh, in order to get it all in, there have to be some days which we uh, cover two chapters. This is one of those days. <clears throat> The cause of public education was advanced by quite a number of people uh, following the uh, Millerite movement. Um, <clears throat> the purpose, the, the desire of those who were focused on education was to include manual labor, integrating it with the academic studies and such as agriculture, mechanical work, carpentry, uh, and other plumbing and other things that would be uh, of practical value. Uh, the education uh, leaders were drawing uh, largely from such enlightenment uh, characters as John Locke and Rousseau, and uh, they were seeking to develop a school system that would follow those principles. Now, <clears throat> the early American schools then were uh, characterized by close teacher-student relationships which were advi uh, advocated by the men at, of the Enlightenment. And, uh, one another characteristic is that they were religiously oriented. <clears throat> Jacob Worley was known as uh, a, a specialist with, within the school system, and uh, he uh, developed a system and which involved a lot of different mechanical farming, uh, you know, uh, practical uh, st uh, studies. Another characteristic was the emphasis upon the home circle, that the parents themselves should be involved and, uh, in instructing their children. And of course, this would someday take place within the home school programs that we have uh, today. The importance of, of uh, direct observation was uh, uh, emphasized as being more important than the education that they get from the books. And uh, the schools, some of them who were, that were established, required labor uh, for, from the young folk, regardless of their social status. And this was a good idea because uh, learning to work and uh, uh, seeing work as a very important part of of personal development was very important. In many cases in those days, they looked upon work as being something that only the poor people were involved in. So those who had money were required to work along with the rest. The importance of character development was uh, emphasized as being more important than the academic progress process. And that certainly was a very vital principle. <clears throat> we 
We'll see. <laughs> In America, there had been already uh, experiments with this kind of education, such as the Moravians in Pennsylvania, and uh, the and Methodists at Cokesbury College in Maryland. And uh, <clears throat> this anticipated the American manual labor movement that took place from about 1820s uh, and climaxed in 1834 and then rapidly declined. But you will notice that all of this took place before Seventh-day Adventists began their educational program. So we uh, were not the first in education any more than we were in, uh, in the uh, health and the other uh, reform movements. However, the Lord led us in a way in which the reforms were not only carried out, but were continued and developed over more than a century of time. The stress on the agriculture, that is the practical labors, the stress of that was uh, also placed on the idea of economics, which is quite logical and is helpful. People, young folk could go and uh, earn their way by working uh, at the school. <clears throat> A typical reform group was the manual labor in literary institutions. And in that in, uh, program, they fulfilled all of the different requirements that we've just mentioned uh, uh, before. Furthermore, <coughs> we also mentioned that there was a diminishing uh, uh, of what happened was that anti-slavery focus uh, became so intense that it tended to diminish many of the other uh, reform movements, including those of education. Now, <clears throat> the home schools, uh, children were taught very basic skills in their home. This was very important, but they needed to be shielded from the ridicule that might take place if they were involved in a, a more formal setting. So the homeschool became a very Im important factor. And in early Adventism, it was the only education we offered to the children. As early as 1858, James White uh, invited John Byington to open a homeschool and to invite area residents uh, to care for children who might come in to that school. It was a home school, but with other students invited to come in, and a very, very inexpensive, I believe it was $2.75 for a term for, for a board and room, which to us seems almost uh, meaningless, but at that time, of course, money was much more valuable than it is now. Lane Seminary uh, operated with a program in which students must work two to three hours a day. That was in Ohio, and this resulted in Oberlin College following a similar plan, and it was Oberlin College that uh, would uh, give uh, Alexander uh, Bell his basic training uh, as he began the work in Adventist schools. Many other home schools were started, but all of them failed after a very short time and were closed. In the meantime, from the very beginning, uh, in 1852, uh, early in the beginning of our uh, publishing work, James White 
uh, started the youth instructor. The purpose of the youth instructor was for home schooling, for home training, and providing uh, uh, Bible studies and other things for the students uh, to study at home. It was M.G. Kellogg in Battle Creek who developed the first Sabbath schools in our movement. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, M.G. Kellogg then uh, became the uh, initiator of our Sabbath school movement. And it was Ken Wright, while he was still involved in our work, who insisted that if even two children were present, there should be a Sabbath school for them. Uh, there was no excuse then not to have a Sabbath school because there are only a few children. Now, of course, in our Sabbath schools today, we have it for both adults and children. But at this time, it was just like the Sunday school movement with the, uh, with the Protestants. Uh, this was our first launching into the Sabbath school program. It was in 1872 that Ellen White uh, wrote her first major uh, response to a vision that she had in which it outlined the different things that we were to accomplish for the young folk. And in that, uh, she mentioned the fact that we are reformers. No. No uh, apology at all. We are reformers and we need to be in the reform mo uh, mode. However, there was not very much interest at that time by Adventists in the, um, in the uh, agriculture and, and uh, you know, the practical training. As a matter of fact, the focus was so much on the second coming, still thinking that Christ was coming very soon, uh, that they questioned whether it was really very important to have an educational program for the children, which indicates that at that period of time, most of our children did not have an education. In fact, education was just beginning, uh, public education was just beginning to take hold. <clears throat> but at that time, it was James who suggested and advocated that we should have a system of education. We had developed a publishing program, we had developed a, a health program, and now uh, we have had developed, uh, we need to develop an educational program that would go along with it. Ellen White emphasize the fact that since we have no idea when Christ is coming, we don't know the date, that we need to be educating our children. <clears throat> In spite of the fact that they needed their own education, and in spite of the fact that James at one point began to raise money for a program to, to be developed in Battle Creek, he actually ended up deciding it was not wise to have a program there because of the worldliness and pride exhibited in Battle Creek. And uh, he felt that this would not be a good time to start a church school program. It was in 1867 that uh, uh, G.H. Uh, Bell uh, attended Oberlin in Ohio. And uh, it was in 1868 that, uh, pardon me, <coughs> it was in 1867 that he came, uh, he had already attended there, he came to our institution for healing because he had burned out. 
and it was in 1868 that he um, was asked by Edson White if he would teach some of uh, the young folk there. And so he began uh, a, a little educational program for James and W.C. White and for their friends. <clears throat> and it was uh, in 1868, the next year, that the Battle Creek Church uh, employed him to teach them, but unfortunately, they did not uh, continue. It was just a one-year program, and uh, the educational program that, edu that uh, James had encouraged uh, failed, and in 69, and uh, it was about that time, however, that they employed uh, <coughs> Bell, to uh, to be an editor at the uh, at the review, and he was also asked to be um, uh, the superintendent of Sabbath schools, and Alexander Graham Bell did a lot to improve uh, the uh, program that uh, had been started, and he became known as as Mr. Sabbath School Superintendent and was invited by churches in the various areas to come and teach them how to operate their church schools. Uh, it's interesting that in 70 and 71, uh, James White and Uriah Smith uh, together organized a minister's lecture association and the tuition for that was five dollars a year for the men. And those ladies who would participate would pay three dollars a year. That's pretty, pretty uh, low uh, tuition, isn't it? But they uh, were to teach Bible, grammar, and penmanship, uh, uh, amongst other things. Uh, this actually seemed to have lasted only a couple of years because there's no record after 1871 of it having continued to exist. And it was in 71, that same year, that James White made another attempt at an educational program, and he developed a, uh, a Review and Herald Literary Society. The purpose of that society was to upgrade the, um, uh, the publication's work and to train young folks so that they were able to produce a higher quality. They would uh, have readings of, of various high quality of moral and spiritual books, and they would discuss it and they would write uh, and, and this would develop their writing skills as well as their understanding. In 1872, I mentioned before, Ellen White's testimony came out, and I have itemized nine different things that she indicated should be involved in an educational program. First of all, parents were to be the only teachers until children were eight or ten, where they were more mature and able, where their eyes were, f for, were uh, more mature for one thing, and their brains too. And uh, then they were to have physical, mental, moral, and religious training, training in all major branches. She em emphasized the fact that teachers were not to control their students, but they were to teach them to reason from cause to effect and to understand principles. <clears throat> the habits and principles were more important than literary attainment. And they were to learn to socialize, learn how to relate to each other in a loving, kind, and thoughtful manner. 
And uh, they also were to have commodious rooms that were well ventilated. Now this, of course, today our classrooms are almost always uh, under the direction of the state supervision that requires that kind of thing. At that point, the schools were often cramped and crowded and had little uh, ventilation, which was not a good basis for uh, uh, learning. They were also to combine the physical labor with their studies. They were to learn how to do agriculture, mechanical work, girls were to do domestic sciences, and they were all to have a thorough grounding in the Bible. And uh, teachers, uh, were, those who were going to be teachers especially, they were to make sure that they had an adequate understanding of the Bible. Later, this group of points that we've just mentioned was began to be called the blueprint. You may have heard someone comment about the blueprint of education. This is the, uh, this is the uh, vision, and these are the points that were emphasized in that vision. Now, in 1872, uh, James White led out in the ad uh, uh, adoption or the uh, appointing of a committee to develop a denominational school that would be representative. And he also began immediately to seek pledges. And uh, <clears throat> so they began to raise money for a, an educational program. There were uh, the students, the prospective students were asked to send in uh, the kinds of education they really wanted to have, needed to have, and the level that they would be on so that they would know how to do the uh, planning. For a period of time, there was a lot of excitement over this because they began to see that this teacher, teacher training program, uh, they would be able to train people to go overseas and to and to, uh, uh, to develop uh, schools and so forth, so that there was quite a bit of, uh, of emphasis. One thing that was uh, uh, mentioned at that very time, Admar uh, Vulemar uh, had discovered Adventism and it had, he and, uh, and uh, We'll come to him in a minute, I can't say the name. But anyway, uh, the representative had come to um, uh, the United States and we could see, the people, our leaders could see how this could be a means of developing our work overseas. So what did they decide to do as far as an educational program? It was very simple. They would take bells uh, program, he called it his select school. He had developed a system and they decided to use that system. Unfortunately, they felt they needed to have someone with a high degree to operate that. Bell himself did not have a degree. He had been at Oberlin, he had learned principles but he did not have a degree. But instead of appointing Bell as the leader, they chose to uh, get somebody who had a, uh, a doctoral degree. The Bell School was operated on the principle that methods must not foster pride and vanity, and that the uh, mental discipline. They were to, to um, teach the farmer preachers who would come to this school, and one of the important parts, uh, purposes of the school was to, to 
be able to educate our ministers because our ministers had almost no education. Many of them had virtually no education. And uh, to provide a program of discipline that would help teach them uh, the art of discipline. And uh, one thing that Bell insisted on is that ignorance was no help to spirituality. I don't know if you've heard it in our day or not. I haven't heard it since I was a, a young man. But there have always been people who've insisted that higher education is uh, deleterious to spirituality and that it was, it was really better if a person didn't have so much education. And of course that depends on what the higher education is and how one attains it. But the fact is that ignorance is no aid to spirituality. They were set not to have a long course, but have a fairly short course and to put people out in the field where they could work. In March 1873, uh, the General Conference chose to uh, uh, develop an educational society to direct the educational work. And by November of that same year, $52,000 was pledged. Now, we had already started an educational work, but now we're going to develop it on a higher level. There were discussions about what property to buy. There was 160 acres of foster uh, the Fosters had, they wanted $50,000 for it. And the fairgrounds that they was there, they could buy for 10000 whereas there was a 12-acre Hussey estate for sixteen. And uh, Ellen White, of course, was eager for them to have a large acreage. The 160 acres of the Fosters would have done, also the fairgrounds would have done. And uh, when they left the uh, uh, Battle Creek area, Ellen White understood that they were going to be buying one of the larger uh, uh, acreages. But when she returned, she found they had bought the Hussey estate, the 12 acres. And uh, this caused her to weep. But one of the things that's important is how did she relate to the brethren as a result? She had given counsel, and as uh, far as she knew, they were going to be doing that, but she came back. She simply joined with them to make the best of it. This was a great disappointment to her because she and anticipated having a program where they could teach uh, agriculture and where they could teach uh, various kinds of other things such as uh, uh, blacksmithing and uh, other uh, things. At any rate, when they started this, they started it uh, with two professors. <laughs> Bell with and and several assistants but two professors bell was to teach reading writing arithmetic and geography and bookkeeping the the basics he had some assistants to help him and sydney brownsberger with some assistants would be teaching greek latin hebrew french german philosophy and physiology now notice this was not a very balanced program because there's no agriculture, nothing in here about the practice, nor is there any Bible there. However, Uriah Smith did teach a Bible class which was not required, but the students could uh, attend this Bible class 
and many of them did, but there was no uh, required Bible program for the students, which indicates that there were some problems that needed to, to be resolved in our educational program. Right from the beginning, they could have started with the blueprint, but they, they didn't. This is not a blueprint program. They decided that uh, for boarding, they did not have any facilities, but they decided to have the students live with it in the different homes, and they felt this would be good because they'd have a home environment, as it proved to be a very serious problem, actually, with each of the students in a different home environment, a variety of different attitudes and so forth, and uh, eventually it would be seen that we must have a boarding school. But to begin with, we started without a boarding school. In 1874, the Educational Society was legally uh, established and a three-story building was formed. In January of 1875, it was dedicated. There was dedicated a building that would uh, house about 400 on a seven acre plot that was now only, uh, that is a 12 acre that was now only seven because they had uh, sold off five acres in order to raise money for the rest of the educational program. So you can understand why Ellen White would weep because the concepts of the brethren was not yet what it should be. <clears throat> By 1880, various changes took place in the board, and uh, one of the major changes was that J.H. Kellogg was invited to become a part of the board, and J.H. Kellogg was one who was very strongly committed to practical education. So there was Kellogg, Butler, and Bell who were urging practical training, but Brownsberger, who was the president by this time, by the way, to begin with, James White was the president and Brownsberger was the principal who carried the practical duties. But Brownsberger had no background in uh, practical education, and he was moving in one direction. The board was trying to move in the other, and this resulted in a very uh, difficult situation for both, and it wasn't very long before Brownsberger resigned, and uh, they tried to decide what would they do to, to replace him. Well, they still weren't ready to, uh, to uh, take uh, Bell, who was the one who would have been capable of running it, but he did not have a degree. So there was a man who was learning just then, becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, was not yet one, and he had been a minister in one of the other churches, and uh, they thought, well, maybe he would be a good one to do it. He had a, a degree. So they asked Alexander McLaren to uh, become the president of their college. It was not long before he was in conflict with Bell, who had a lifelong commitment to practical education, and McLaren not only knew nothing about it, but didn't seem to be interested in that kind of thing. Unfortunately, Uriah Smith backed McLaren, and the result of that was that there was intense conflict. One of uh, McLaren's sons uh, at one point knocked Bell down the stairway, and uh, as a result, Bell decided he wasn't going to be taking any more, so he resigned. And uh, <clears throat> as a result, 
the college was closed for one year. They decided that it would be better to have a closed college than to have that, all that commotion. As a matter of fact, the faculty was in rebellion against the board when the uh, board uh, sought to fire certain individuals. They refused to resign. <laughs> and so the board had little control over them, so they decided they would just close the school, which they did. And it was a year later before it was reopened. However, as a result of this, there were actually two more colleges that were brought into being very soon. And one of them was in Healdsburg, uh, California, uh, under Brownsberger, who by this time had learned his lesson and was ready to foster practical education, which he did uh, at Healdsburg, which became Pacific Union College later on. They transferred to that. The interesting thing was that it was called the Healdsburg Academy, and the citizens of Healdsburg itself uh, appealed to them to change the name to Healdsburg College, which they did. And uh, another college that was established that uh, also began as an academy was in uh, South Lancaster uh, under Bell. So although there were problems and, and it was necessary to close down for a year at Battle Creek. Nevertheless, in the process, we had two new colleges that were opened. And now we turn our attention to the worldwide outreach. In 1865, uh, G.I. Butler became the president of the Iowa Conference. Now, behind that Iowa Conference, uh, I see I don't have any notes for it, but uh, I need to share a little bit of background. Before he became president, there were some real problems because um, uh, there had been, they had developed the um, Iowa Conference by calling two men, Snook and B.F. Snook and Brinkerhoff. Uh, Snook had been a pastor of a Methodist church and Brinkerhoff had been a lawyer. They invited them to be their first president and secretary treasurer, but it was a very short time after they became a, a, a were placed in position that they became dissatisfied and critical of James and Ellen White. There was a period of reconciliation and it appeared as though everything was resolved, but it wasn't. And uh, they continued their disaffection and uh, they especially uh, joined with what's called the Marian Party Marion, uh, Iowa, that uh, uh, full of disaffection and so forth. And so what had to happen was that they had to be uh, removed from office. And, uh, and in replacement, George I. Butler was asked to be the president. And uh, he did prove to be uh, uh, very helpful. He uh, would go for, in his buggy from one church to another and help each church to understand what was happening and to secure the support of the different churches, which resulted in uh, a positive uh, growth. The main uh, area, of course, Marion, uh, continued in disaffection, but the rest of the churches were saved from this. 
Butler's statement later on as general conference president because he was to become one of the uh, prominent general conference presidents, and we'll be studying about him later. But his statement was, a minister's duty is to evangelize new fields. The fact is that the principle then was that a pastor is not to pastor a church, but he is to be an evangelist and to win new converts and to train them then to become leaders and to, to uh, organize and to administer their own churches. As a result of the active evangelistic program that was uh, uh, made possible, uh, that, that was uh, encouraged and, and uh, increased in its ability by the uh, plan of God for, uh, for uh, the members to give their tithes and their offerings and so forth, as a result of that, the membership nearly tripled during the 70s. There were a number of house, husband and wife teams. It's a, an ideal plan is for wives to share with their husbands. Not all wives are, are capable probably of doing so, but wherever possible, it is a good idea for wives to join with their husbands in evangelism. And the Lord blesses when that, is, ha, that happens. In 1881, there was a discussion similar to some that we're having now about women's ordination. And one brother uh, uh, presented a resolution that they uh, ordain women. And that was a, a resolution that was uh, placed upon the uh, General Conference Committee to examine and evaluate. Unfortunately, or fortunately, at least there was nothing done about it one way or the other. Now about the Far West, the Upper Columbia and uh, Oregon, the Oregon Territory and the, the area. It was in 18, well, California first. It was in 1859 that uh, M.G. Kellogg, the uh, older half-brother of uh, John H. Kellogg, um, moved to San Francisco. He moved as uh, a carpenter, earning his way as a carpenter. It wasn't very long before he was in conversation with B.G. St. John, and St. John uh, accepted our message, and now there were two of them working together. And in that, uh, that inspired uh, Kellogg to begin public meetings. And as a result, it wasn't long before there were 14 who were uh, worshiping together in Kellogg's home. And uh, be not long after that, uh, J.W. Cronkite, who was a cobbler, came to town and he would set up, he was a, a, a Sabbath keeper, he would set up his prophecy charts in his cobbler shop. When people would come, they would ask him questions and uh, he would then have the privilege of answering the questions about what those charts were all about. And as a result, there was quite a, 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 a increase in the interest in the uh, Adventist movement. Before long, uh, Kellogg decided, as he read the articles uh, concerning uh, the Ellen White's articles regarding healthful living and those articles that had to do with the Charles' uh, uh, educational program and so forth, he had the conviction that he needed to go back and get training. So he 
left California and went back to Troll's program and, and uh, spent a year in that. And it was before he left, however, that the little group that he was with repeatedly sent trying to get a minister. In fact, they sent $133 in gold to the uh, general conference at one point uh, asking, uh, Kellogg decided that he should go and get medical training and so he went to Charles Hygiotherapeutic College. That was the name, quite a mouthful. Uh, and uh, took the training there. And while he was there, he attended a general conference session. And uh, at that general conference session, he made an appeal to the brethren to send workers to California. And it was very interesting because uh, it, it seemed as though no one was going to respond. And they got almost to the end of their each, by the way, during the sessions, they would assign people different places. And they may send them to a different state or a different part of the country. But at any rate, they had come to the place where it was only one or two left. And Loughborough stood up and said, I had a dream. In my dream, I was impressed that I should go to California. And uh, James White said, all right, but is he going to go alone? Who will go with him? And D.T. Bordeaux uh, said, I will go with him. So they had a, a team of two. And this, by the way, is an important principle from the New Testament. Jesus sent the uh, uh, disciples out two by two. They can encourage each other, pray for each other, and it's, it's a good plan. But at any rate, uh, as a result, uh, James immediately began raising money. And he raised $1,000 for them to buy a tent and for their uh, fares to go out through the Panama Canal and down uh, and up into uh, the, uh, California. So that happened, and as a result of his uh, article appealing for funds for these men, a New York newspaper picked it up and uh, published it. And this resulted in some very interesting results because way over in Petaluma, California, there were a group of independent Christians and uh, they got hold of this article, and as they read, they realized these people were coming, and so they decided to contact them, and the Lord had given one of them a dream also that there were two men, and that they would be establishing a, a tent meetings, and that they should invite them to come to Petaluma. So, as a result, they sent a delegate down to San Francisco to uh, check this out, and within a half hour after arriving, they were in, in, in communication uh, with Loughborough and, uh, and uh, Bordeaux and inviting them to come and hold meetings in Petaluma. Well, the interesting thing was that they went to Penaluma, and the Lord blessed, and there was quite a large interest. But the devil was at work as well, and those people that invited them, uh, because the ministry ministers in the different churches uh, uh, opposed them so strongly, they confused these people and they actually turned against them. But in spite of it all, they had, their, uh, had already um, presented the message to many people, and there were 20 who made their decision uh, to step out and become Seventh-day Adventists. 
One man who attended there was Abram LaRue. Abram LaRue was a wood chopper. He was a, a transient person who happened to be there. He attended their meetings and he was very much impressed by their literature and he decided that he uh, would like to go uh, as a missionary to China. And the brethren were not able to send him, so he got literature and took off, went to Hawaii and began a literature ministry. After being in Hawaii for a period of time, he went to Hong Kong and then to other parts in the East so that God used various, even uh, the insufficiencies <laughs> Uh, and inabilities of the denomination to spread the, the gospel. And you'll notice that in this and many other cases that the work has largely been scattered by lay people. And this is really as God would have it. There was an interesting thing that happened in California when a, the uh, California Christian Advocate editor ridiculed the tent preachers as uh, ex-Millerites and, uh, uh, and uh, predicted their soon demise as William Miller and his group failed, these two would fail. But what he didn't realize is that there were some people looking for the prophecies. There was a man by the name of Wood who had tried repeatedly uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, I meant Hunt, uh, William Hunt, who had tried repeatedly over a period of 20 years to secure books on Daniel Revelation without success. And when he read this, uh, these articles of ridicule, he thought, oh, these people ha must have something on Daniel Revelation. So he wrote to them. And how did he get the letter to them? He didn't know who they were. So he sent uh, a letter to the elders of the t at the tent in Healdsburg, California. And the mailman, of course, they knew that it was Healdsburg, but the, they knew also from Healdsburg <coughs> there was only one tent. <laughs> so the mail got right to them. Elder Loughborough uh, sent Daniel Revelation and a number of tracts. As a result, there were, was communication between uh, Elder Loughborough and William Hunt, and within a short time, Hunt had purchased, not only had he subscribed to the Review and Herald, but had purchased nearly all of the uh, materials that we had available. And uh, a year later, he showed up at Loughborough's meetings, and he wanted to buy Loughborough's chart because he was headed at that same time to New Zealand uh, where he wanted to uh, uh, become, you know, do evangelism. And so it was that he did take the chart to New Zealand and after a while he decided to go to the African diamond mines. And he became uh, a, a very important part of the development of our work. In 1870, Loughborough and Emmy Cornell uh, were doing evangelism throughout various areas of California. And during that period of time, a man by the name of Miles Grant stirred up a lot of interest in the prophecies. He was not a Seventh-day Adventist, but believed in the Advent, near Advent. And uh, when he left the team, Loughborough and uh, Cornell were able to reap a 
very uh, strong harvest by leading these people completely into the message. At about that time, Cornell and uh, Loughborough, I'm sorry, Cornell and Canwright, who was there for a time, uh, actually seeking to improve his health. He was in a, a, a poor condition. Anyway, they were about to hold meetings in Oakland. And during that period of time when they were starting the meetings, the newspapers were full of reports of ghosts uh, that were uh, seen in a certain uh, uh, buildings. And so what the our evangelists did was to, to uh, use the headline, Haunted Houses, The Mystery Solved, or The Devil Unmasked. It re resulted in a large audience. And during that same period of time, there were uh, the temperance forces were working against uh, a a alcohol, and uh, our brethren offered to let them use their, temp uh, their tent as a means of doing their work. And uh, there was a great deal of appreciation for that. And when the meeting, their meeting, temperance meetings were over, they went to San Jose and encouraged our men to come and help them there, which gave them a, a, an entry into San Jose. In 1872, James was just trying to regain his health, still not strong, and so they decided to go to California, thinking that the weather in California would be uh, in, uh, inducive to uh, health. And the next year, while they were there, uh, James White began to think about the need for a press and for a paper in California. And it was in 1874 that he uh, was ready to, to open the Pacific Press and uh, produce the signs of the times. It was the next year that they actually developed the uh, publishing Association. And in 78, they, uh, there in California, a new uh, facility was opened at St. Helena, California, which is the Rural Health Retreat, just a little above where Ellen White would later on uh, have her uh, Elms Haven where she lived at the last few years of her life. And by the way, just a matter of note, uh, our family moved to that area in 19, January of 1950, and we purchased Willie White's home. Ellen White had ceded seven and a half acres to Willie uh, to, for his home. And uh, it was on a knoll, and they had uh, sold off five of those seven and a half acres, but there were two and a half acres, and the three-story building that, J that uh, Willie had built. And uh, we happened to purchase that uh, to operate a, an elderly care facility, and uh, my brother-in-law and sister purchased that from my mother before she died, but my sister died also, so it's in the hands now of my brother-in-law, but we still, our, our family is still attached to that uh, Willie White home. It is now called, my mother changed the name to Rose Haven, and if you will go to the sanitarium, just at the bottom of the hill, uh, just before you get to the little bridge, to go up to the hill to the sanitarium, you'll see a little lane called Rosehaven. Rosehaven Lane. Rosehaven Lane goes right directly into uh, to our 
my brother-in-law's place. Pardon? Yes, it's, it is. My brother, my brother-in-law was a landscape artist, and uh, my father had done a great deal uh, to develop the land and to start that. But he has continued it and made a very beautiful place out of it. Now for the real Northwest. <laughs> Actually, we're California's the West. Now for the Northwest. Augusta Morehouse lived in the Walla Walla Valley area, and she was eager to share her faith, and uh, she shared her faith in the Sabbath to Franklin Wood. But Franklin Wood decided he didn't want to become a Sabbath keeper, and in order to get away from this influence, he sold out what he had and moved to uh, California, the Sonoma Counter, County. But he arrived there just in time for Loughborough and Bordeaux to start an evangelistic program. And would you believe it, he attended those program, that evangelism. He accepted the message. And with less than a year after he moved to California, he moved back in order to help uh, influence his family, uh, the other family members, his father and others who still live there, and as a witness. So that Franklin Wood became then one of the individuals who helped develop the interest in, in our message. And those who were there repeatedly sent to both California and the General Conference, please send us a minister. Well, several years passed by, and there was no minister. But in 1874, the General Conference sent Isaac and Adelia Van Horn. Isaac had been uh, a, uh, in, in the Treasury Department of the General Conference. They sent him as an evangelist. And the same year he arrived, while he was doing his first evangelistic effort, uh, a, man, a young man by the name of Alonzo T. Jones attended his meeting, Sergeant Alonzo Jones, and was baptized that summer. As soon as he got out of the army, a few months later, he uh, married uh, Isaac's wife's sister, Adelia's sister, and began evangelism. For nearly a decade, he worked in the Northwest as an evangelist. And in 1884, he was invited to uh, join the Signs of Times program in California, at the Pacific Press. And he became the uh, co-editor uh, along with uh, Wagner. We'll see more about that later. But uh, Alonzo Jones then became one of the most well-known of Seventh-day Adventists. In the early work, our members felt that it would be impossible for us to have a work around the world there were messages that Ellen White had given, including the 49 vision in which she saw a little paper and spreading around the world that seemed to indicate that our work would go uh, overseas, but it was too much for our early leaders to recognize the possibility of extending our work that far. But what they decided to do was to uh, work for the, um, for the different nationalities who had come to America. And uh, so they worked for the uh, Scandinavians and for the Germans and, and for others. And this was their way of, uh, of reaching the world. But John G. Madison was a, a Scandinavian 
who was had a great burden for his people. And he worked in Iowa, Minnesota, and the Great Plains. He translated literature into the various uh, Scandinavian languages and uh, wrote tracts and so forth. In 1872, he developed the first of the denominationals, denominations, uh, extra languages, uh, and Danish monthly. And that was the, his uh, Adventist uh, Signs of the Times, uh, his, his magazine for evangelism. Louis Conradi uh, did the same for the German Americans. His in, history is very interesting because he contracted with a man in Iowa to clear his land. And in order to, to live, he had to stay somewhere. And there was a neighbor who invited him to stay with them, a Seventh-day Adventist neighbor. And as he stayed with them and he was involved in their, in their meals and their worship and so forth, he was very much impressed by their sincerity. And it wasn't very long before he became a Seventh-day Adventist. With the help of these friends, he attended Battle Creek. He worked in the Review. And in 1881, he was called to work for the German-Russian Mennonites of the Dakotas. Um, this is just a little taste. This is some of the first parts of our work for the various language groups. But it was as a result of the efforts of these folk who brought new members into the church, those people would want to send back to the old country, to their own families and so forth, the literature. So it was in this way that much of our overseas work was established. In 1857, a Polish priest by the name of M.B. Tchaikovsky uh, became a Seventh-day Adventist. He was eager to go to, uh, to Italy and to work there. He had a special burden for the Alpine Valley and for the Walden Seas. But the General Conference recognized there were serious weaknesses that he had and they declined to send him. So he went to Boston and there he persuaded the Advent Christian leaders uh, to send him to Italy. He took with him uh, Elder Butler's sister, Annie Butler, who was an Advent Christian, not a Seventh-day Adventist, but an Advent Christian. So she went with him uh, to Italy and became his secretary and was, to a large degree, responsible for much of his success. Um, it wasn't long before he relocated in Switzerland because the opposition he had from the various churches in the uh, area that he first went. But Tchaikovsky never kept in touch with our people. He chose rather to represent himself as one who had discovered all these truths. People would ask him, uh, where did you get this? You know, where did you learn this? Well, I studied the Bible. I found it by studying the Bible. The fact is that he did continue to receive some materials from the church, but he never allowed his members to know that there was any other church that had these the same principles. It was at a time when he had come for a time, he had gone on to do some work in other areas. He had become involved in, in serious financial problems and so forth. But he had been there and his, uh, had left a review in one of the areas where he had stayed. And it was uh, at that that Albert Valmuir found the review and 
suddenly realized that there was something bigger than what they had there. So he sent to the uh, General Conference, to the Review and Herald, and uh, asked them for more information. The result was communication with our people. And uh, in 1869, they invited James Ertzenberger to come as a representative to the General Conference session of 1869. Now, James did leave uh, Europe, but he did not arrive in time because of difficulties. He did not arrive in time. However, he did go to Battle Creek College. He got training, and he and Ertzenberger were both instrumental in helping start the work in uh, in Europe. Our first regular worker sent to Europe was J. N. Andrews. It's of interest that J. N. Andrews was sent to Europe and uh, James White asked, who will go to England? And Loughborough said, I will go to England. We uh, somehow missed the uh, fact that Loughborough was uh, uh, before he went there was the president of the new California conference. So the California conference president left and went to England to open up the work in England. This is just a little picture of how our work began. It began in sacrifice. It continued in sacrifice. And I would like to say that it will end in sacrifice, and you and I, we are given the privilege of committing our lives fully to the spread of this message, and God has promised to us to be with us to the end, and uh, it will not be long before Christ will come and will receive his people. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for this privilege of being here today to study about our pioneers, and we pray that we may have the same zeal and the same commitment and receive the same blessings of those of old. In the name of Jesus, amen. The glasses did help. <laughs>